Many of you would be right now looking at your career, what you want to do, uh, as I did a hundred years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and looking at choices, you know, those are important choices. You know, what you do, you follow your passion, you do something that you're really passionate about, you do something that, um, that will give you security, financial security, and all that. Those are dif di difficult and important questions. Uh, I know what my answer is because I've, I've followed my passion all my life. Um, and there are like uh, three major instances where I had to be confronted with the, with the choice of either following my passion or following the checkbook. And each time I've made the decision that took me here. Um, but let me start with uh, uh, telling you a little bit about myself, because otherwise what I'm going to say doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I was born in Tawa, Sabah. Anybody from Sabah here? We rule. Uh, I left Sabah when I was very young, I went to start at 10, and I spent five very unhappy years in Singapore. where I reacted very badly with regimentation. I don't like regimentation, I don't like rules. Um, and I got suspended from school four times. <laughs> I almost expelled once. <laughs> uh, that's why I ended up in England, because my parents thought I'd better pack this boy um, away and send him to England before he ends up in prison. Um, so I spent my uh, large part of my, uh, some parts of my secondary school years uh, in England. And then I became a better student. <laughs> and got myself into the LSE where I studied law. And I also had a postgraduate degree in law, mainly specializing in theory, which is legal theory, social theory, and stuff like that. I also taught at the LSE for two years. In those subjects, uh, throughout, I've always maintained a uh, very close passion for the arts. And for me, that expression was through music mainly, but also through uh, writing and film. Uh, for example, at university, I had uh, a settlement of lectures. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not encouraging it. <laughs> but it's kind of fun, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I kept three bands at university, and at the same time, I I, uh, I was moonlighting as a composer for a, channel, a TV channel called Channel Four. Um, so I started a turn professional whilst I was in college. And uh, when I did my masters, everybody else found jobs, you know, and I was still a student. And uh, so the first, first instance of me having to confront the choice, as it were, uh, came when I was uh, doing my masters uh, and teaching. And over summer, I took a job at the uh, I thought, you know, I'd better find out what being a lawyer is like, right? Uh, so I, I took a job at this uh, legal firm called Berwyn Layton in the city. They specialize in intellectual property. Uh, and the summer job sort of got me to uh, look at a lot of contracts, entertainment industry contracts. And I can clearly remember me looking at uh, this contract and it had this wonderful name on it because I was a big fan of his band. Or, used to be his band, broke up now. Uh, it was the contract, employment contract for Robert Plant, who is the lead singer for a band which you guys would probably not know. I don't know how many of you know Led Zeppelin. How many are fans of Led Zeppelin? The rest of Taste, that's a little bit of Taste, man. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was looking at the, the contract for this guy called Led Zeppelin, and he's employing a session and a guitarist, and, uh, and I sat down there thinking, 
man, you know, do I want to spend my life looking at contracts like this, or do I want to be the subject of contracts like this? Um, and so this what happened at that time. My Hong Kong band, yeah, well, sorry, the three bands I told you, well, they're kind of they're, they're kind of different genres. And the, the sort of fun band that I didn't take very seriously was I didn't sing in that, that, in that band. It was somewhere uh, the lead singer was a Hong Kong singer, a Cantonese singer. And that was my fun band. You know, we never took it seriously. And that was the band that got signed. <laughs> it got signed to Hong Kong. So I had to make a decision, and I thought, well, you know, I, I want to do music, really. So, I was, and anyway, it was kind of safe, you know, I was, what, I was 24, 22, something like that, I can't remember. Um, and if I got it wrong, I could start again, it's not an issue. So I flew myself to Hong Kong and spent a few years there, made a record, it was a top 10 record. I don't like it, I burnt all copies, so I don't bother looking. <laughs> Um, and after about two years, I sort of came to the conclusion that I didn't like the industry. I love music, but you know, music and music industry are very different things. And I decided that uh, this music industry thing wasn't so fun after all, because it's not really about music. And. <laughs> And here comes the second moment where I had to choose. Um, I hate, and I still somewhat hate interviews. I don't like to be interviewed. Um, and I, I hated it more then. I was younger, more stupid, angrier. And uh, I was asked to go on breakfast TV to be interviewed live to, the, to Hong Kong. <laughs> now, anybody who knows you know I'm a night cat, you know, I'm terrible in the morning. So in the morning, I'm extraordinary, it's extraordinary. So, <laughs> so I was in this interview, and my manager sent, sent the instruction that, you know, Pete really don't like to be asked questions such as, what's your favorite color? <laughs> you see, the noise they have, they're it's got nothing to do with music. Um, I can remember the VJ, very pretty girl. Um, sort of look down the list and sort of try to pick questions and so on and so forth. They went on and on and on and I was a like, grumpy self. And then she asked me, what's your favorite type of woman? <laughs> 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 now, I took a long time answering that and in my head I flashed. I thought, I really, do I really want to spend my life doing this? Answering questions about <laughs> what my favorite color is. <laughs> um, and I then thought, no, I don't. I don't really want to do that. This is meaningless, you know, it's stupid. And it's nothing to do with music, the passion that took me there. So I looked at her and I said to, to the question, I'm not advising this, gentlemen, please don't, ladies and gentlemen, please don't follow me. I. <laughs> To the answer, what's your favorite part of woman? I looked at the pretty girl and I said, not you, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and that was live on Hong Kong TV. <laughs> As you can imagine, I got into a lot of trouble with that. Eh? It's a good training for things like this. <laughs> uh, and then I decided, well, you know, that's it. You're a big hoo-ha, and I'm going to leave my home. I don't want to be there anymore. I don't want to be in the industry anymore. And I'm going to leave the industry. I saw the second time I sort of chose to be loyal as it was my passion. And I thought, well, I'm broke, you know, so I did find a job. <laughs> so I opened the papers, and uh, it was the South China Morning Post. And there glaring at me was this ad from an investment company called Paul Gunnett looking for a research analyst. And most important thing was that the, the salary was for good money. So I applied for the job and I got it. So that's how I became a financial analyst. <laughs> Very strange. <laughs> uh, I did six months of that, and then a friend of mine from the university had an opportunity to 
uh, start up her own stockbroking and investment company here. And she called me and said, Sinjo, do you anybody want to come back and start up and head up my research department? I said, oh, well, you know, anyway, I'm not sure. And she said, well, you've never been to KL. You're in Malaysia, but you've never been to KL. I said, well, that's true. OK, let's do that. So I quit my Hong Kong job, and I came ahead. That's how I ended up in Malaysia. <laughs> in KL, rather. Uh, I told my friend, I said, you know, I, I can't see myself doing this for a long time. Uh, so he had to set me a target. Send me a target and I achieve it and I can fuck it off. And then do something else. She said, well, you know, uh, we're a local uh, stockbroker and, and we really want to get institutional clients from America. In order to do that, you need to be rated by Asia Money. Your research department needs to be rated by Asia Money. And that's your target, Alice. You can't leave me, yeah? Ah. <laughs> anyway, two and a half years later, we got rated. And the morning after that, I left. <laughs> um, because uh, by then I decided, you know, I don't really want to spend my life just selling paper on the phone. Um, and so I, I left a very well-paying job and I took up music again after a break of about three years. In a time where I've never really lived. I don't come from. And in some way, actually, nobody knew I was a musician. <laughs> uh, I started playing at this little pub called No Black Time. And that's how I started my, restarted my music career for about 300 bucks a gig. From thousands and thousands of dollars a month to 300 bucks a gig. <laughs> Good job, man, savings. <laughs> Um, it was an insane decision looking back. Because really it's, uh, it's insane. I mean, you, know, you give all that up to play for 300 bucks a okay. game. And you know, the sort of music I do, I don't know how, much, how many of you know my music, not the stuff I do for PSAs, but my music is very depressing. It's suicidal music, you know? It's, it's stuff that you take a razor blade and. Yeah. <laughs> That's all music. Uh, <laughs> it won't sound. <laughs> uh, but you know, looking back now, you've seen those, you've seen them at home, you've seen 15 in Malaysia, every single, you see all the, I mean, some of you may have seen the films that go, that I act in, or go out to international festivals, and, and so on. And every single one of those work in the last 10, 8, 10 years were collaborated with people I met at the time. Um, I met Yasin Yus uh, Amat there, I met guys like Ko Yohan there, Tan Shui Mui, and, 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 and all the filmmakers who are now today regarded as the new wave, what they call new wave Malaysian cinema in the International Film Festival, AF uh, circuits. Uh, and you may not know this, but uh, if you ask international doyans, you know, programmers of international film festivals, whose job it is to find new filmmakers, new voices in film, in cinema. And you ask them which are the top three places where new talents are emerging in world cinema. And one of them would be Malaysia. We have a very rich crop of filmmakers. Um, and anyway, so that's a little bit about how I end up on this lectern. From no back tie, obviously I went on to do music, I do films, and I uh, collaborated with a lot of people who first were collaborators, later became friends. And we get together and we make things, we make things like this. We make things, we help each other make each other's work. And all that is driven by passion. I mean, you're talking about a world where nobody really did anything for mine. Uh, my first few acting gigs we did for beer. Uh, for instance, I I was in that circle. I was first to break out. My first record uh, did very very well on the radio. It got international airplay and so on. So I was the first artist in that sort of no black tie independent world, underground world, the dangerous, dirty underground world. 
to break out into the mainstream. Now, um, and so it was kind of popular commodity for a while because you know what? Because they all cast me in their films because hey, he's the only known face amongst us, and he's you know. I remember walking on the street and and a little girl bounced up to me and I said, hey, "Are you Peter?" I said, "Yeah." <laughs> And she said, yeah, I'm a big fan, and I'm a filmmaker, and I'm making this short film, and uh, I'd love for you to act in it. I said, I'm not an actor, man. She said, no, no, have a look at the script. And she showed me a reel and so on. And uh, well, cut a long story short, I said, look at the script, look at the reel, and I thought it was fantastic, it was really good. So I agreed, and so we met again, and uh, she said, you know, but I, I don't have money. How much you cost? I said, how much money you put in Morgan now? <laughs> she, she took out 40 bucks. I said, I'll take 30. <laughs> I give you 10 bucks back to take taxi. <laughs> and we bought three beers and we shared it with the 30 bucks. That's how I got into that world of acting. And the film went on to win the top short film award in the top short film festival in the world. What I'm trying to say is that there is something magical when you work with people with passion. There's something magical when you work with a group of people who are driven by more than just monetary gains. Yep. Because there's more to the world than just money. Other money is great. But you shouldn't be driven entirely by it. Um, more importantly, so as you will find out based on your career. That beyond a certain stage, this question of gift, talent, whether you have talent in doing what you do, this talent thing is actually grossly overrated. Because beyond a certain stage, everybody around you is talented. Everybody, or else they won't be in play. They won't be sitting next to you or competing with you. They won't. They'll be seen a long time ago. The wannabes who've been gone on it. So that's the real things. The people who've, who've got it, who've got the talent, who's got the gift. So they sort of cancel each other out. <laughs> and what is important therefore is longevity. How long can you stick it? How hard can you work? And if you're tra traveling a long, long road, and most of you have long careers. You know, I, I don't know, I've lost touch. How old are you guys right now? Yeah. <laughs> 20, 21, 19, something, something like that, right? Now, um, look, you've got another 50 more years to go before you croak. <laughs> I'm somewhat less. And it's a long road. And as with every instance where you're traveling a long way, it's important to have fuel. And passion is your fuel. Passion makes you work harder. Makes you continue to work when others are dropping. Makes you continue to work when you're tired and fed up and losing more morale. As you all do, some stage of your life. So I'm one of those who say, you know, if you have to choose, always choose passion. Because that gives you the best chance of success. Um, in every industry that you care to go into, there will be some that are more lucrative and some that are less lucrative. But you know, I'd rather be an extremely innovative garbage collector <laughs> than a very ordinary stockbroker. And what makes you an extraordinary garbage collector? It's passion, you have passion for garbage. <laughs> Grace of garbage <laughs> at 50 meters. <laughs> um, so, yeah, please. And if you look at the, just remember this that it's a long road, you have a long way to go, and there will be disappointments and successes as all of us will face. Uh, and what keeps you going the longer that you, you get going, the better. What keeps you going is passion. And what keeps you learning is passion, and you find that you know if you're, you want to be good at something, you keep learning it. 
uh, every time I start a new project, I feel like nervous, to be very, very honest with you. Yeah. It's always, always new. It's always, I don't know, what are we going to do now? What? What name we know? <laughs> what are we going to do with him? Beat him. So, yeah, so it's important to, 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 to stay passionate. I don't know what you do, you know. It could, it's, it could be what I do, it could be. That's, that's a garbage collection, it doesn't matter. Um, stay passionate, because that's going to give you longevity, it's going to give you stamina. You know, always people always tell me, you know, uh, you know how did you get an open break? And that issue will come up with you, too, how did you get an open break? And I always think back to what I read about this, what this golfer said. He's, he's a very famous golfer. So famous I've forgotten his name. <laughs> South Africa, I can't remember his name, but anyway, what he said was uh, the harder you practice, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Now, Gary Player, that's it. That's his name, sorry, we need nothing to do, forget it. Uh, and there's a lot of logic to that, you know, because if you look at what is luck, think about it, what is luck? Luck is shorthand for saying, Here's an opportunity floating by, and I'm just so lucky. So, so happens I've got the skill. I'm in a position to grab it and use it. Yes, that's what that means. It happens to float by when I have the skill. What makes you have the skill? Hard work, experience. So if you don't have those hard work, it just float by and you miss opportunity. So with that logic, the harder you work, the luckier you get, because you grab every single opportunity that pass you by. Um, you get every, op uh, you make use of every, every single opportunity that come your way. Um, and not all of us will be overnight sensations. You know, the day you graduate, you become Steve Jobs now. Ain't gonna happen. Steve Jobs took 30 years. And some of you will take 30 years to get to where you wanna go. And in order to get to where you wanna go and uh, traverse that 30 years and still maintain what you do, the quality of what you do, it takes passion. So choose passion. I think I've said enough. I'll leave you asking questions. Thank you very much. You seem really relaxed, so what I do want to ask you, what got you to brokering in the first place? Like, did you stop music completely, or did, you, did it change you as a person? I read this book uh, called, uh, you should read it actually, I think it's still being printed. It's uh, written by uh, a fellow LSE alumni called Michael Lewis. And the book is called Liar's Poker. Liar, as in liar, liar, liar. liar. <laughs> liar's Poker. And the book is really a study of greed. Uh, it studied essentially the phenomenon on Wall Street for, for the roaring 80s, where 24 euros were making 20 million US dollars a month, and, uh, a year, uh, uh, and what happens to the community like this, and what happens to people like that. Uh, it took uh, Goldman Sachs, which is, uh, I think, most of you know, uh, the, uh, the context was actually the Goldman Sachs generation of the early 90s. Study of greed, and I was very interested in that. So, uh, when, uh, and I was broke. So, you know, so I thought, well, you know, where's the money? <laughs> um, so I went broke because of that. Partly because I needed the money, also partly because I was interested in, you know, I'm a sociologist, you know, so, so um, in my search. So I thought, well, let's go and find out what greed is. That's why I don't grow. Why is greed? I mean, the greed. I think greed is where you put. We don't get enough. I think one of the problems with that industry is that uh, it's like a trap. You know, once you go into an industry that pays you so well, you buy your first big car. You pay you more, you buy your first big house. 
you get married, you have kids, then you put them to very expensive schools, and then it's impossible to leave other them. <laughs> They're trapped. <laughs> uh, so I was very aware of that when I left Brooklyn. I said, you know, I don't want to be trapped in that. Uh, and many of my friends are still in the investment banking, and uh, they're looking much older than I am now, you know. <laughs> uh, and and some of them don't even enjoy the working. So I'm glad. Right. Uh, audience, do you have any questions you want to ask? Um, uh, my name is Han. What is it that you're trying to achieve through your works uh, in the arts and entertainment industry compared? Do you have a master's in law? Why, do you, why don't you try to do something else rather, rather than just doing what you're doing right now? Where is it, where's the modest operandi and the main objective of Oh, let's throw the girls up, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's my question. No, I'm joking. So you don't throw me. Is it what I mean? What's my purpose of doing this? I, all my life, there's something that you guys are going to think about. How you define yourself, you know? It's, it's the important issue. All my life I've defined myself with the arts, with my music, with my writing. Or in some, some cases, my film now. That's how you position yourself, it's to give your, your, your life some sort of bearing and meaning. And for me, it's always this you know, expression, expressing something. Um, that gives me at least meaning. I mean, if you give me a check for hundred thousand dollars, I won't feel very proud. If you give me a check for five thousand dollars, doing something that I find meaning in, actually, I feel very proud and all that. Um, so the answer to your question is again, like I said, I think it's how you, what sort of life you want to lead. I mean, some people define their worth in life with the size of a bank account. Some people define the worth in life with other things. For me, it's other things. For me, it's what do I contribute to society? Uh, do I touch lives and, and change them in a positive way? And that to me is more important than, than anything else. That's why I do what I do. Um, just because I went to law school doesn't mean that I have to be a lawyer. I think it's a very important realization that your education does not necessarily dictate your career. It doesn't. You'll find that, you know, I've, I've been to law school, I've never studied economics, though, really. I mean, I've, I've done finance, I've done economics, I've done, you name it, you know, I've, I've produced films, I make music. What's, get, what's that got to do with my law school experience? Nothing. But, but I tell you what, you know, those law school experience helped me as well. Because now I don't get a lawyer to work the contracts. <laughs> Sorry, next question. Yeah, um, so what's your favorite type of girl? <laughs> <laughs> no, you bitch. <laughs> okay, so honestly, honestly, I'm like, do you plan on going like international, like, you know, going further west and bringing like the heritage further west or, you know, like what are your plans to go I already bring, bring quite a lot of bands to Korea and Japan, actually, because I'm, I'm one of the first Malaysian musicians to play, or independent musicians, I mean, to play outside of the country. I toured America, Europe, I, I very regularly play in Japan and Korea, because my, my records are released in, in, in Korea and Japan. In fact, my record gets more airplay in Korea and Japan than here. <laughs> uh, and being a regular sort of musician who do the circuit in Japan and Korea gives me a lot of opportunity uh, to bring younger bands and all that to Japan. And Korea recently, Reza Saleh, you know what I mean? Reza Saleh is in Japan with me. Um, he just finished his tour and I introduced a whole bunch of people to him before, uh, which ended up with him touring Japan for about three weeks. Uh, about a year or two ago, I, I brought a Tampa man to his rock band, I, I brought him to, to Korea and so on. So yeah, it's, it's important to, I think, bring some of our best talents out. I think we do, we are a country that is quite strange. We are a country that has a lot of underdeveloped talents, a lot. You know, uh, this country is a weird place because it's full of talents. Now, I'm not talking about, like, you look at the films and so on, you, you, you find Steven Spielberg, because that's confusing talent with production value. 
Yeah? I mean, if you give these people 400 million US dollars, they're probably make a pretty decent film. But these people are making $50,000 films and win awards with them. So, differentiate between talent and what production value means. Yeah? I mean, you might hate a film because it's simply a credit card film, production value is, is low. Doesn't mean they have no talent. Now, um, so I, I also see it as part of what I do to try and get as I don't have a Jesus Christ complex, right? but I mean, but I do what I can to get people out and give them the opportunity. In fact, right now I'm talking to Tony Fernandez about maybe helping, helping some of our artists, musicians in particular, how to do the world. Really. So um, you do what you can, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think. I don't think it's always possible to bring people out simply because you can, or simply because they're talented. The industry is far more in, uh, uh, complicated than that. Uh, it, it takes more than talent, even in music, even in the arts, to make it. Yeah, it also takes luck, it, uh, it takes hard work, it takes savvy. Um, I mean, a lot of sort of studio, studio jam bands uh, are good in the studio, jam, you know, in the sort of student circuit. But they never translate to a professional set. Uh, because it takes a different mindset. I mean, when I was picking a type of man into Korea, I thought Korea, this rock festival in Busan, about 30, 40,000 people on the beach. And they are easily, they are easily, Type of Man was a fantastic band. They are easily technically the best band in that festival. And I set the band down uh, the day before, and I said, you know, you, you guys are the best band here. You guys are, oh, they're Japanese band, Korean bands, you know, US bands. Technically, you guys are the best band, but you're going to get your ass kicked anyway. Why? Well, you know why? Because we don't work hard enough. The Korean band were up there, they played their pre chord song, they're nothing technically difficult, but it's fantastic. They don't even count in. You know, how many of you are musicians? You know what counting in means? To, to those people who are not, counting in means you, you give a starting beat for the band to say, ta, 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 boom, no, yeah? You set the tempo and, and so on. You just, you know, the normal drummer does that, either on high hat or on the stand. Korean bands don't do countings. They look at each other and go. That is how scary they are. <laughs> That's a very small instance of how, you know, it's not just your talent, it's also hard work. It takes a lot of work to be this good. You know, and it is impressive, and it is professional. And what we have here in Malaysia is that we don't really have a lot of facility for young bands to play. We don't have a circuit, so it's very hard for our bands, our musicians, however talented they are, to get what I call seasoned. They don't play enough. And that's always an uphill battle when you hit, hit, hit bands you know, that, that play 200 gigs a year. They do this in their sleep, you know. It no longer work, it's no longer can you know? So, so I think that's one of the issues. But yes, you're right. I mean, we try to bring bands up, but I think it's not always possible. What is more important is, you know, all, all those bands and all those artists has got to learn themselves. I think not rely on infrastructure. The music industry is broken anyway. It's broken. Don't rely on the broken machinery. Do it yourself. Yeah. 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 Yeah.